Hey guys, the ugly mug is back. And what does it bring to your lovely video screen? Well... That's right guys, I'm going to be bringing you a video response to Anita's latest video, The Scythian, a positive female character within gaming. Now possibly like many of you, I did run to my window to see if the world was ending when I saw this video had been released. Luckily the world is still with us. Unfortunately that does mean that uh, we are left with a mind numbing Anita Sarkeesian video. The hero of the 2011 pixelated adventure game Sword and Sorcery is a brave adventurer known only as the Scythian. Is that meant to be a person? It looks kind of creepy. And the game tells a story of her quest to collect the three pieces of the Golden Trigon. Now if a quest to collect pieces of a magical triangular artifact sounds familiar, that's no accident. Sword and Sorcery's Trigon is a clear reference to the Triforce of the Legend of Zelda games. And Link's recurring quest to collect pieces of the Triforce is perhaps the most famous heroic quest in the history of fantasy adventure games. By drawing on familiar gaming icons and conventions that many of us already associate with legendary quests and timeless adventures, Sword and Sorcery quietly asserts that women can fill the role of mythic hero as effectively as men can. So first off, the game is a rip-off or inspired by Zelda, so what does that have to do with the actual protagonist? Second of all, what other inspirations has the game pulled from? Please explain. And third of all, hasn't this already been done with games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Fire Emblem Awakening and Jade Empire, just to name a few, where they are fantasy adventure games? Granted, Mass Effect is more of a sci-fi adventure game, but I think you get my drift, that these games have female protagonists that can do exactly what the men can. How is it any different? With the aid of a gorgeous and mesmerizing soundtrack, Sword and Sorcery's retro-inspired visuals paint a pleasantly abstract landscape players can navigate through the simple act of tapping or clicking. I suppose with some, this soundtrack can be gorgeous and mesmerising in of itself, but for my personal taste I prefer the soundtracks of Jade Empire, Dragon Age Origins, uh, Samurai Warriors and Dynasty Warriors, and Chrono's Trigger, gorgeous and amazing soundtracks in themselves. As opposed to the game mechanics that she mentioned, I understand that this was originally meant to be an iOS game, so simple controls need be. But if that's a slight push to say that this is a perfect game for women because it has simple controls, fuck you, Anita. I'd rather have complicated controls, thank you. But I'm just going to ask a question: What does all that? have to do with the female character with the pixelated it that you are presenting what does it have to do with that and the game tells a traditional yet emotionally resonant story proving that you don't need technically impressive graphics to create a world worth exploring and a tale worth telling any lifelong gamer can tell you that. In fact, the level of detail is so low in our pixelated protagonist, and our tendency to assume that heroes are male by default is so widely reinforced, that some players have made the mistake of assuming the Scythian is male, at least initially. Two points here, Anita. First of all, I can't tell whether that is a human being, let alone male or female. But, thankfully from me doing my research, I actually did find out that it is, in fact, a female character. And also, yay for glorious fan art! 
because that also helped clear a few things up. So, personally, I couldn't tell if that was a human being or a goose-like creature with stick legs. Well, second of all, and this is the main point, you see that it's reinforced that we assume that any character of this type is male. Well, it's not reinforced throughout video game narrative or things like that. It's actually reinforced throughout history and also the myths and legends and stories that we hear throughout our lives. Because who were the soldiers? Who were the warriors? Who were the adventurers? And who were the explorers? That's right, men. Now, I'm not saying that there were absolutely no women warriors, adventurers, explorers or soldiers because one of the most prevalent that I can name off the top of my head is Joan of Arc. But within the generals at the time it was the men who were the soldiers, the warriors, the adventurers and the explorers. Women were meant to stay at home and look after the children and the farm and everything like that. Uh, that's what women were meant to do back in like old times. So what different now? We have women soldiers in the army, we have um, women scientists and things like that. We have women in the fields. It's a lot different nowadays. But back then where this type of character would actually fit, it is mainly men. So, yeah. Thankfully, the game doesn't resort to clear gendered signifiers like a pink outfit or a pretty bow in her hair. So, says the woman with pink streaks in the hair, the plastered on makeup, and hoop earrings so big I'm surprised she doesn't have uh, mini basketball players shooting hoops. Seriously, if we're going to go into gender signifiers, look at yourself first, Anita. Nor does it present her gender as some kind of surprise twist like we see in the original Metroid. In both visual design and writing, sword and sorcery is subtle about asserting the Scythian's gender. Though once you acquire the Megatome at the end of the game's first episode, you're presented with the thoughts of other characters who refer to the Scythian using female pronouns. So it is a surprise to find out that the Scythian is female just like Metroid. And don't diss Metroid. It's not just in the visual sense that the Scythian lacks clear definition. We know very little about her history and nothing about why she's undertaken the quest to defeat an ancient evil. While games often give us images of heroes who are fated to defeat evil forces, it's rare for these heroes of myth to be women. Like many video game heroes, the Scythian is essentially a silent protagonist, a figure defined primarily by her actions, which makes her a blank slate for all players to project themselves onto. So it's bad that Link is a silent protagonist. As gamers can't project themselves onto him because he has a backstory and he's male but players gamers can seemingly project themselves onto a blank slate and she's female into the meat of your video Anita we finally get to hear why you like this character and she's nothing more than a blank slate she has no characterization she has no meaning in this world we don't even know why she's on this quest Thankfully, I did look up the Wikipedia and look at the Sword and Sorcery and find out the plot. I will save that for later. But, 
We have no idea why she's on this quest. We have no idea why she's in this world, why she's exploring this world. We have no idea who she is. She is a blank slate and you like that. Even though you have criticised characters for being blank slates. But let me give it let me get this straight. You don't like protagonists being male because women can't project themselves onto the the male characters. They can't identify with the male characters. You don't like female characters like Femme Shep, like Bayonetta and many others because they're either over sexualized, they're objectified or whatever other shit you come up with. But you like the Scythian because she's a blank slate. Please tell me you hear how stupid that is. But while we don't actually hear her speak to other characters, a bit of a Scythian's personality does come through as her thoughts serve as a kind of narration for the story. Oh, so I suppose thought bubbles make everything better? No. Her quest is referred to as a woeful errand from very early on, an important bit of foreshadowing that communicates that her task is not a happy one, but the grim nature of her errand doesn't overshadow the Scythian's spirit or the tone of the game itself. I'm sorry, the mind numbing is starting to take effect, guys. But Anita, I'm sure that Link had a grand old time trekking through the evil darkness, preparing to fight Ganondorf, knowing that his life is on the line. I'm sure he had a grand old time. I'm sure it wasn't woeful at all, fighting all those evil creatures, preparing himself mentally to fight Ganondorf. I'm sure that Mario had a grand old time trekking through the wilderness, trying to get into Bowser's castle. I'm sure he had a grand old tea party with Bowser afterwards. I'm sure it wasn't woeful at all. I'm sure that the student from Jade Empire, whoever you may play as, had old adventure trekking through ancient China, being shot at by pirates, being martial arts styled by assassins everywhere they freaking went, to save their master and to save a goddess known as the Water Dragon. Spoiler alert if you haven't played the game. I'm sure that they had a grand old time. I'm really sure. I'm sure they all went to cake and tea parties afterwards. Not every adventure is going to be a happy delight. Of course it's going to be woeful. It's an adventure with risk. The character's quirky, often humorous thoughts, along with the sense of wonder in the world, makes this journey magical, delightful, and melancholy all at once. Sword and Sorcery is broken up into a series of short sessions, most of which focus on the Scythian acquiring pieces of the Trigon. There are some simple, timing-based combat encounters, but the majority of time is spent exploring the world and solving simple puzzles that require players to pay attention to environmental details like trees, birds, and reflections in the surface of a pond. So it's kind of like Professor Layton with a bit of Fire Emblem Awakening thrown in, I suppose. A bit of combat, but a lot of puzzling. Right, okay. But how come we're back to gameplay mechanics and the actual game itself? I thought this was a review on the Scythian, not the game. I'm going back to why you think that the Scythian is a positive female character, please. The game is primarily concerned not with combat and killing, but with the natural beauty of the world the Scythian is trying to protect. Using the mysterious power of the Song of Sorcery, players sometimes manipulate the environment in some really surprising ways, creating the feeling that this is a magical world where just about anything can happen. 
Okay, at this point, if you haven't finished the game yet, you should just go do that right now. Even if getting to the end involves a whole real-time moon cycle mechanic that might take you a couple of months to complete. Unless, of course, you reset the clock on your gaming device, or if you're able to find the special moon grotto location. But spoiler alert, we're about to talk about how the story ends, so you've been warned. Most video game heroes become more powerful as their quest progresses. This is one way in which sword and sorcery subverts expected gaming tropes. There's nothing in it for the Scythian. She doesn't gain more health or better gear over the course of the game. In fact, the quest takes a toll on her. She starts the game with five units of health, but loses one each time she wins a boss fight, decreasing her overall maximum health as her adventure progresses. Okay, story-wise, that seems interesting. It's not every day you come across a game where the protagonist continually gets weaker as the story or game goes on. It's definitely something different, I'll give it that. But because you haven't given us context, Anita, as to why she's continually getting weaker, I'm going to bring up why I think she's continually getting weaker. Um, now, as I said earlier on, that I did look up the plot in the Wikipedia game, so spoiler alert if you haven't played the game or are, or are interested in playing the game, just skip to my next rebuttal. But the Scythian is on a quest for the Megatome. Again, because she's such a blank slate, we don't know why she's on the quest for the Megatome. What is her... Uh, passion or what is her goal in getting the Megatome, we don't know. But she has to go to a cave called Mingi Tor, and which is the big base cave that we see at the beginning of the video. Um, she goes in there, she, see, she releases the Megatome from a skeleton of some sort, and as she claims the Megatome, she releases a creature, an antlered creature, and that's when the Trigon splits apart and she has to reform the Trigon. I believe, looking at that, and then seeing how the character gets weaker as the game goes on, I would say that she is cursed and being forced to collect the Trigon. So in a sense, it could be also the fact that she has a sense of responsibility for actually releasing the creature and releasing the Trigon. I cannot say for sure. But, because again, Anita does not specify. But I would say that she is cursed. So how is this positive to the Scythian? Does this show that she has high resistance to a curse that is fatally killing her? Or is she, or is this nothing to do with the Scythian uh, characterization whatsoever? Do we just not care? I leave that up to you, my viewers, as to how you take that. But I thought I would give you a bit of context since Anita doesn't. This game is not about leveling up or becoming more powerful. And Sword and Sorcery ends with the Scythian doing something Link never has. To rid the world of an ancient evil, the brave hero sacrifices herself. Unlike the deaths of so many female characters in games which serve the purpose of fueling the development of male characters, the Scythian's death is tragic because her life had intrinsic value. We projected ourselves onto her and experienced the world through her. In the game's final moments, we see the people of the region pay their respects to the Scythian, and we mourn her death along with them. She didn't just exist in relation to another character. She wasn't just somebody's wife or sister or daughter but rather she existed as an individual and as a hero. The game's ending suggests that the Scythian will not be forgotten by the other characters. You know what? I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to play a clip. I'm going to let that clip speak for itself.
My friends, we are gathered here to pay our respects to the Grey Warden that saved us all. She gave her life to destroy the Blight. A sacrifice we must never forget. It was no accident that she was there either. She was special. And each of us had our life touched by her in some way. I... I thought we would be together forever. The Grey Wardens couldn't have asked for anyone finer. How do you properly honor someone like that? The Grey Wardens are building a magnificent tomb at Weishaupt. And the visuals and music work together to elicit a complex assortment of emotions, a sense of celebration of the Scythian's courage, and a sense of grief at her death. Well, Jinkies, we haven't seen that done before in every movie and TV show ever. Really? Again, what does this have to do with the Scythian? Can we go back to the Scythian? While the necessity of the Scythian sacrifice is worked into Sword and Sorcery's story from the beginning, and lends this particular game an emotional weight its quest might otherwise lack, we certainly don't want all female heroes to be tragic ones. But we do need more women-centric stories of all kinds. When archetypal fantasy heroes and games are overwhelmingly portrayed as men, it reinforces the idea that men's experiences are universal, and that women's experiences are gendered. That women should be able to empathize with male characters, but that men needn't be able to identify with women's stories. Sword and Sorcery gives us a female protagonist, and encourages us to see her as a hero first and foremost, one who also just happens to be a woman. So what about all the other characters? who are first and foremost heroes that just happen to be female that every one of your critics has pointed out. What about them? The Scythian is not special. And that's the end of her video guys. Oh, mind numbing. But what can we take away from this video? Besides it being a, a debut episode of her um, new series, which in a way promises more mind numbing, but what can we take away? Why does Anita Sarkeesian like the Scythian? She's a blank slate. She looks nothing like a male or female, let alone human, and nothing else. Most of that video was about the actual game, nothing about the character. Maybe the fact that she has a very good resilience to a curse, that's on my personal belief of what this video game actually gives us. but. Anita Sarkeesian does not elaborate on why she likes the, Sith or the Scythian whatsoever. The only thing we can take away from Anita Sarkeesian liking the Scythian is the fact that the Scythian is nothing more than a blank slate that looks something like a goose alien thing. Again, fan art comes in handy. There is one thing I need to point out, guys, and I am going to be playing devil's advocate for this. I've been hearing people say that Anita Sarkeesian has essentially abandoned the Tropes vs. Women in video game series for this new series. I kind of want to take people back to the Tropes vs. Women in video game series list that she provided on her Kickstarter. If we were to actually look at video number 11, we see that video number 11 is positive female characters in gaming. What she has essentially done is split up this video into several parts, again to drag things out. Just like she did with her damsel in distress videos, just like she did with her women in background decoration videos, she has split this up to drag it out. What I believe this video should have been is a quick top 15 list or a top 20 list 
of positive female characters with a quick analysis on the character. But instead we're going to be getting videos to describe gameplay, the game mechanics and the world around it instead of focusing on the character. So she hasn't really abandoned it, it's just more dragging it out. And to Anita, I just want to say, this is not what your backers asked for. Your backers gave you money. Remember the $158,922, Anita? They gave you money to create these videos. You have failed them. This is not what your backers wanted. Again, I feel sorry for the backers. They gave you $250 and are still waiting for the DVDs. So that's the video, guys. Hope you liked it. Comment your thoughts below. Comment what you thought, Anita. Comment on what you thought about Anita's video. Comment on what you thought about my video. Shut up, though. And I'll see you next time, guys. Bye.